Well, hello everybody again. This is um, the OpenShift Commons briefing. Uh, we do this every week as often as we can on Thursday mornings and we are trying to um, address most of the things that are of interest to folks who are in the OpenShift community and this one today is top of mind for me. Um, has always been, as we say, a persistent problem. Um, persistent storage for containerized applications. Steve Watt, who is our chief architect in the Emerging Technologies group at OpenShift, not at, at OpenShift, but at Red Hat itself, um, is going to walk us through how to do this. And I'm going to turn it over to Steve and let him um, introduce himself a little more and get going. And then we'll have Q&A through the chat and then at the end of his presentation and demo. So go for it, Steve. Uh, thanks, Diane. So, as Diane said, my name is Steve Watt. Um, I work in the Emerging Technologies Group at Red Hat, and um, I lead the um, Container Storage Engineering Program at Red Hat. And so, um, that means that um, I work with OpenShift to um, enable the storage features um, it, within OpenShift, and then I also work with our um, storage business units um, and our engineering teams there to basically um, prepare our storage portfolio to work with containers um, optimally. So um, in this presentation, I'm going to um, first uh, catch you all up on the current state of the art around um, storage enablement within OpenShift, um, just to sort of set a platform. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, where, we, where are we are going. Um, and so I'm going to talk about containers connecting to storage um, to start off with. And then I'm going to actually talk about running storage platforms in Kubernetes in, in OpenShift. OK, so um, I first want to um, jump to, you know, start on this slide, right, which is sort of the road to storage as a service, right? And so um, what you see here are sort of five dimensions around um, enterprise IT and how um, they've sort of progressed downwards um, towards the current state of the art. So the, the top row is sort of where we started and the, the bottom row is where we ended. I'm sure many of you being OpenShift users are quite familiar with this, but you know, um, the main thing is we, we've sort of in a world now where we're, we're using sort of DevOps um, operational, uh, sorry, DevOps software engineering processes where the development roles and the ops roles are, are you know, often co-located within the same team with uh, multiple, with people starting to share roles that are both dev and a bit of ops, um, incorporating agile, um, doing small scope, very rapid iteration, um, and sometimes iterating uh, quite often with releases in production as opposed to very long periods of time before changing things in, in operations. And so with, uh, and then we also have sort of a shift to microservices where um, you know, applications are becoming much more granular. Um, the contract is very service oriented where um, they communicate with each other uh, based on RESTful interfaces and they don't care so much about, you know, what's running behind the interface, right? And so it's very service oriented and we're seeing, you know, broad adoption of containers as a unit of deployment, often packaging the entire microservice itself. Um, and these containers are running sort of on cloud platforms, right? And we've seen that the data center specifically change from, you know, having the cloud and the data center and everything in enterprise in the enterprise running in the data center and just startups using the cloud to, you know, the enterprise um, running some stuff in the data in the data center and some stuff in the cloud. And now, you know, where our enterprise data centers are starting to look much more like the cloud. And so this is pretty interesting from a storage dimension because you know um, if you look at where storage started you know you sort of had a, a single box with a certain amount of storage that would get carved up and that you know had uh, various amounts of constraints they're very expensive you know you need to buy a better sort of storage appliance um, uh, if you're starting to run out of storage capacity and so you know, we got many kinds of uh, economic benefits by moving to scale out software defined storage platforms like the Hadoop distributed file system and ClusterFS and Ceph, things like this, which took advantage of the economic benefits of commodity x86 infrastructure. And, you know, that, that was awesome, um, but also not very cloud-like in that um, you uh, had to go tap a storage administrator on the shoulder and say, hey, would you go make me a block device or a distributed file system volume? 
and tell me what the connection information is. And so, you know, your productivity was sort of gated on how quick storage administrators could turn around those requests. And so, eventually, uh, we're we're moving to the enterprise data center being able to consume storage as a service in the same way that we consume. Um, you know, storage in the cloud, right? So we'll have, you know, microservices running in containers, running in a cloud-like enterprise data center that can submit, uh, re you know, restful, recall, restful calls to a storage service that says, hey, go make me a block device or go make me a volume, provide the information and I can attach it, mount it into my container and use it right away, right? So that's, that's sort of broadly speaking where we are. And so in, in OpenShift, uh, and I just wanted just to double check, uh, Diane, are the slides changing? Um, so yes, yes, indeed, they are changing. Okay, all right. So just double checking. So the one you're seeing now is what is in full screen? Uh, storage innovation for containerized applications. Yep, that's correct. Okay, so um, so what you're seeing here on this slide is um, is what you get with OpenShift 3.1. Uh, which you know is is being released this week, right? So, um, and and what this the way the way this works now is that your you know containerized applications that run in OpenShift, um, and you know this this feature is obviously available in Origin as well. Is that um, you have you know your OpenShift cluster, and then you have independent storage clusters, um, storage assets, um, and you know, you require a sort of a storage administrator to go and create these. They may have done them in the past. Um, and so you have a lot of pre-existing storage assets. The, these might be block devices like Ceph uh, uh, RBDs, um, iSCSI uh, block devices, um, Amazon EBS disks, uh, Google Persistent disks or fiber channel block devices. Or these may be shared file systems like um, NFS or GlusterFS. And what you can do is that you can basically register them within OpenShift for consumption as a persistent volume, and then you can submit claims that get bound to these, and then you can use them. And this is great in that um, you know you have sort of a single control plane for uh, being able to at least take these um, you know pointers to your storage and and allocate them to applications and then use them. Um, and you have um, a much wider choice of uh, persistent storage than you know you used to, which was like you know the available storage capacity on the Docker host, right? And so um, obviously these these are the additions. We've always had host path and empty dir within um, OpenShift, um, so which are, which are local storage um, available within Kubernetes. And and the other big thing that we've added um, recently is volume security. So before, um, when you were accessing NFS, you know, or uh, iSCSI, Ceph, etc., everything was done as root root, right? Um, and so, essentially, the the storage asset had to be configured to be accessible, you know, wide open, right? And so that this is a huge thing that we've added recently, which is to be able to add um, support for Docker supplemental groups. And so, uh, the way we've incorporated that within the OpenShift security context is that for um, block devices, um, you, your uh, OpenShift user will be assigned a particular uh, uh, FS group, a particular type of supplemental group, and that supplemental group will be used to perform what we call a takeover of the, the block device, which means completely own it. Um, so it sets the SE Linux context, for, uh, sets all the appropriate SE Linux labels so that um, that group and that container can access um, that block device and then it does the relevant churn and chmods to that d device so that um, the file system on that device is set for access only for that particular group right and so um, so now we've gone from essentially wide open security to at least group level um, access control and um, same with the shared storage um, shared storage works a little differently um, so we can't, we don't have the same level of automated access control that we can do on block devices. They're a little different in that, um, you know, the other aspect with shared storage is that uh, you don't necessarily, um, uh, the container won't necessarily own 
the shared storage, right? The container might be using just a part of it, and you know the accounting group might be running Python applications that you know use the same shared storage as well, right? So you've got a you know it's shared asset. You've got to be a little more considerate about how things work, and so you know the, the way that works is that basically you config, configure you know if it's an NFS share, um, you configure the directory access permissions for access by a particular group. Um, if it's a cluster FS volume, you do the same thing. And, and then you basically provide that group in um, with your pod um, in the security context as a supplemental group so that all IO that, that accesses those um, NFS shares or cluster of volume directories will have uh, full access. Um, but um, any other groups that attempt to access it will not. Right? So, so this is what we have in 3.1. And um, here is sort of an example, a visual example. Uh, Diane, just double checking. Are you seeing a, uh, a, a yes, diagram? Okay, great. So, um, so on the left, um, what we have here is an OpenShift cluster um, using shared files, uh, shared file storage. So this is Red Hat cluster FS, uh, Red Hat cluster storage. And an example of where and how you might use this is that um, you have a scale out web server farm. And you really don't want to um, copy the, your web content onto every um, single server within your web server farm um, and have the pods mount it and use it directly, you know, using something like a host path volume plugin. Um, instead, you know, it makes a lot more sense to be able to store all that information centrally in some sort of shared file system. So then anytime your content team wants to make an update, they just change it in one place and they don't have to update all 50 servers in your web server farm. And so, um, and so, what you would do here is configure, you know, your nginx pod uh, to uh, use a claim against a, a Gluster FS um, volume, and you know, store your content inside that, and then basically gives you kind of a unique um, um, set of controls from a control plane perspective, and that you know, you can have your development team, your content team copy data in directly into your Gluster storage, um, just using uh, file system mounts. Um, but if you want to scale out your web server, um, you just change the amount of replica instances that you're running for that. And um, they will, as, as the new pods come up, they will automatically bind to the same cluster. So there's literally no work you have to do to scale out and make sure that those new pods connect to the same cluster of face storage. Um, and another example, sort of the same cluster where that example is running, but uh, you also, um, you know, your web application has a database backend as well, right? And so that's running MySQL. And so, um, you know, your uh, the issue is that, uh, you know, um, part of the benefits of running your containers in OpenShift is that you get container orchestration so that if there is some sort of disk failure in your cluster, that um, you know you can use OpenShift to ensure that you know your your container gets started up somewhere else, right? Sort of like a singleton pattern, right? And so the problem is, you know, if you're storing your database on the local file system, um, when that container gets moved somewhere else, um, your database files aren't there, and so uh, that's a problem. And so um, when you want to basically be able to store your database on some sorts of uh, network disk uh, to get around that problem. And that's a classic example of when you choose something like Ceph or uh, RBDs, right, which is basically a file on block device. And so you would use the um, a persistent volume claim against a, a Ceph RBD or a, a direct volume um, against an RBD and in your pod definition um, for your MySQL uh, container. And you would store Varlib MySQL into wherever you're mounting the Ceph file system. And so what would happen is you would create this uh, database and then um, you know, if, if the container needs to get moved, when it starts up, it will connect back to exactly the same Ceph RBD and uh, automatically, uh, you won't have to do anything. Um, and your database, as, as it starts up, your database will come back right back up with all of its files and keep working. So, so this is what uh, we have today. And um, so this is great, but if you recall um, what I spoke about storage as a platform versus storage as a, as a service, this model requires um, you know, the storage to be managed by a separate storage administrator. Um, there needs to be communication between the OpenShift um, users, administrators, and the storage administrator users to be able to consume the storage. 
So we would like, you know, in the theme of DevOps, right, and agility to basically empower our development community, we'd like to make this a whole lot easier. So the, what we're moving to now um, is a hyper-converged model um, as an additional option. So we'll keep off offering the others. Obviously, you have storage investments that you've paid for that you, you want to use. So we will keep offering all of that um, inside Origin and um, OAC. But um, what we're looking to do in, for the roadmap um, is um, basically be able to run storage in OpenShift itself, okay? And also to be able to add dynamic provisioning. So let me start with dynamic provision, right? So dynamic provisioning, the concept here is that um, for storage providers that, that can um, have service interfaces, so examples of this might be if you're running Origin in um, Amazon AWS um, or GCE in Google Cloud or in OpenStack. Um, you know, AWS has EBS disks, uh, GCE has persistent disks, um, OpenStack has Cinder. Um, all of these have RESTful interfaces which you can um, communicate with. We're planning on um, adding provisioners um, so that you're able to uh, basically submit claims for um, a particular class of storage. So say um, you would like a, a AWS a GP SSD um, instead of um, an AWS magnetic SSD, right? You could basically create tiers of storage and use arbitrary labels to describe those. So I would like, you know, gold, the word gold, the label gold mapped to um, EBS GP SSDs. I would like silver mapped to EBS uh, IOPS SSDs. And I would like bronze mapped to EBS magnetic, right? And so your developers will be able to submit claims um, against uh, one of those labels. And then the idea is that um, we will have a provisioner for each different kind of label built into the volume, the overall volume plugin for that storage type. And it would on demand go provision provision the um, storage asset that you want, uh, register the persistent volume and bind it to your claim so that you can use it. And um, now obviously if, if you're an ops person, you know, you might get nervous about the accounting dimensions of this where your developer community could run a, um, a very high bill without you being able to control it. So what we've set are the ability to control claim quotas um, within um, the projects themselves, right? So you can actually sort of empower your developers, but sort of set boundaries as to exactly how empowered they are, right? And um, so that's dynamic provision, right? So um, the, you know, regardless of which cloud provider OpenShift is running in, you should be able to dynamically provision um, storage within that. Um, now these are all block storage. Um, what we also wanted to do is be able to offer um, something cool around shared file storage. And um, so what what we've done is started the Applo project um, in the GlusterFS community, Kubernetes community. And Applo, which is uh, Klingon for container, <laughs> was suggested by one of the members of our development team. And it's sort of a, a, a simple um, a term that so it's sort of stuck. But um, the, what Applo is, is actually running GlusterFS as containers inside OpenShift. Um, and so uh, later on after this, I'll actually show you a demo of how this works uh, in Kubernetes. Um, and, and the idea is if you look at this picture that I'm showing, if you look at the, the dotted orange line at the bottom, right, each one of those sort of cylinders is a storage container, right? Um, and so um, the idea is that um, we can containerize GlusterFS, we can actually deploy GlusterFS as pods within Kubernetes and OpenShift. And we can constitute a GlusterFS cluster that runs inside an OpenShift cluster or a Kubernetes cluster. And then from that, we can carve out storage. Now, um, there's obviously a prerequisite to this, which is the nodes that those containers land on, the hosts, the OpenShift hosts, uh, Kubernetes nodes, have to have some sort of uh, direct attached storage available for Gusta to use, right? So um, this could be an individual JBOD disk. So, I mean, I would say the smaller, smaller unit of uh, server would be, you know, one new x86 server, which they typically ship with, you know, four to 
around four, four to five discs, four to six discs. Um, you know, you really just need a, a single um, whole disc spare to be consumed in this model. And um, but if you have more, that's great, and we support both JBoard and RAID five and RAID six. Um, and uh, and basically, that storage would sort of get aggregated across the cluster, federated, um, and presented um, inside the GlusterFS cluster, and then you could carve out, um, you know, volume, GlusterFS volumes um, from that. And uh, and so then, you know, um, the next aspect of that was to, you know, add a dynamic provision, which is we're still working on. So I'm not I'm not going to be demoing that. But um, so you would create a provisioner for Aplo volumes. So you could, sub, you know, create a, a label called Aplo um, that is mapped to, you know, the Aplo volume plugin, so that when someone submits a claim, it can actually go and dynamically provision storage out of your um, Aplo cluster that's running inside your OpenShift cluster. So there, there are many benefits of this. Um, you know, you know, mainly you know unified orchestration, which sort of means ease of use, and greater control. So single sort of control plane, um, and then obviously the the convergence benefits, um, lower total cost of ownership. So um, you know you're running your storage cluster um, inside, you know, inside your OpenShift cluster. So you've got one set of hardware, that and and a single control plane for sort of your your software defined network, software defined storage, you know, and your software defined compute and applications. So one stop shop from OpenShift origin. And, um, you know, this is actually quite valuable because um, even though you may have storage uh, in your data center, it may not always be accessible. Um, there may be physical impediments to it, uh, to accessing it, but there may also be sort of organizational impediments to access it. Um, in that, uh, you know, it's uh, it's being used in production, um, you know, and any additional um, IEO traffic could degrade the performance, which would make it, uh, you know, the other workloads that are using it suffer um, and to a point where the business wouldn't tolerate it or something to that effect, right? Very similar to, you know, database administrator not allowing any additional connections to the database server, right? So you run into those sort of issues with storage platforms too. And so, um, with, with this aspect, you know, you don't have to wait for that. And if you have to procure infrastructure for a storage platform, that's lengthy. I mean, if you you, know, spend, you spend a bit of time talking to an infrastructure vendor to buy x86 servers, and then you have to go order those and wait for them to arrive. And then you have to wait for somebody to install this, you know, the, the, the software on them, the storage platform software on them. You know, and only then can you make it available to your OpenShift cluster. So there's there's sort of time to solution um, advantages in this model as well, right? And uh, all right, so so with that said, um, I just want to sort of clarify that 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 all this work is sort of not downstream, not product related yet. We're still building this out in the community, um, but it's not more architectural vaporware. As I'll show you, I have a sort of a demo uh, working already. Um, so we're kind of focusing the initial integration within Origin, you know, providing storage as a microservice with dynamic provisioning. And um, it's not just GlusterFS, right? We're looking at um, uh, containerizing Ceph as well. There's a um, pretty well-known project out there called Ceph-Docker, um, which is Docker containers. Um, so we're, we're looking at working with that project um, to sort of bolster it, um, build out some Red Hat Ceph um, clusters from that. Um, Still, sort of deciding on the granularity of the images there. It's a little Ceph is a um, sort of kernel space um, a storage platform where Gluster is sort of a user space. So it's a little different working with Ceph, but um, you know the intent is to um, hopefully be able to do the same thing with Ceph that we're doing with Gluster and bringing it into OpenShift, um, so that you'll be able to not only provision um, a shared file, but also you know file on block. Um, so with that said, um, I'm going to um, show you a demo. So um, Diane, are you able to see the, uh, the demo? Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, all right, so um, let me just, uh, I'm just gonna rewind a little bit here. Uh, so, so what we're seeing here is um, <clears throat> a Kubernetes cluster. Um, I've got uh, a couple of files here. So, um, basically, my Glusterfs, um, whoops, 
my Gluster FS uh, cluster is um, really just two files, a Gluster-1.yaml and a Gluster-2.yaml. Each one of these is an individual pod. So I'm running a two-node Gluster FS cluster. Um, once I run that, um, I will, and I, the first part of the demo is actually getting Gluster FS running inside Kubernetes. Um, so it's able to sort of, I'm able to create volumes from what's running in Kube. And then the second aspect is, you know, the pre-existing bits that already existed. So we've always had a, a cluster FS volume plugin in Kubernetes, um, well, for a long time. Um, Kube hasn't been around that long, but forever how long it's been around, it's been around in that for quite a bit of time. And um, and so um, we're going to use that cluster FS volume plugin. For those of you that aren't familiar with volume plugins, they're just storage adapters. It's just a way to connect your, you know, your application. Your, which is your glass, your your pod in Open OpenShift and Kubernetes to some sort of external storage, right? And so um, I have a, an application uh, which is this nginx cluster, and um, that's the, actually the web server that's going to mount in Hughes cluster. And there's a cluster fs dash endpoints file which uh, is just an array of IP addresses that um, that the cluster fs cluster is running on. That that's the volume plugin requires that. Okay, so let's just uh, move along here. And so you can see here, this, um, this is a um, example of one of the pods that ClusterFS is running. So there's some design decisions um, that are reflected in here. Um, the first is the, the label, right? Um, it's got a, each pod has got a unique label. Um, the second aspect is, you know, if you go look at the, the host network, right, this is a pretty new parameter to, um, you know, Origin and Kubernetes, which is that um, you don't have to use an overlay network or the Docker network. Um, you can actually use the host network. So I'm running this demo on three virtual machines um, running Fedora 22. Um, they... Um, you know, they're 192.168.58. something, each one of them, right? It's the masters.20, you know, worker one's.21, and work, excuse me, worker two is.22. Um, so when the containers come up, they actually share the IP of the host that they're running on. And this is required, um, and this is a, also an, an element of quality of service that we're looking to do in that, um, you know, means the storage traffic. Uh, isn't mixed up into the overlay network traffic that we're able to segment it. Um, and in some cases, you know, we if there's a separate network available, um, so there's two NICs on the server, for example, we might be able to take advantage of that. So it offers some sort of quality of service for a performance value. This is the second aspect is uh, <clears throat> overlay networks are kind of a new thing for storage platforms. And you run into a lot of trouble when you're trying to use them. <laughs> so we ran you know, we're trying to iterate up from a working solution and host network was um, something that would just work out of the box with cluster. So um, the next aspect is the node selector, right? So um, this this is something that I'm, um, it works in conjunction with sort of a, a, another design decision, right? So a node selector um, is something that you can use to pin a pod to always be scheduled on a particular host. Right, so worker one is one of my host names. Um, the cube node node has that same label, and um, so the pod is always going to get scheduled on that server. And um, if that server's down, I don't want that pod to come back up because um, I want ClusterFS to know it's lost the node because ClusterFS is designed to run on commodity infrastructure, and um, you know it basically rebalances data. Right, so um, you can detect when nodes or peers in ClusterFS term have gone offline, and you can rebalance your data to basically have additional replicas of your data created elsewhere in your cluster, right? And so, so that's the one aspect. But the other aspect is, you know, when um, the contain the ClusterFS container on, on worker one um, starts getting used, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to mount um, basically um, a directory on the host called mount brick one right and so mount brick one we're using with a host path volume plugin so host path means hey take this directory from the the origin host um, and basically mount it into this particular place within the cluster right so the place i'm mounting it into in the container is the same place that's on the host um, 
I'm uh, then basically uh, making so I'm providing a local directory on the host available inside the container, and you know I'm using this uh, ClusterFS image um, to actually run the ClusterFS processes. Now here's the thing, right? This is why I'm pinning the pod onto the same worker because after um, you know it's being queued, there's going to be data stored on that local host directory. Right on on the host host path body, and um, so if you go and move that brick to some other server within the cluster, sorry, if you go move this cluster container to say server fifty instead of worker one, uh, when it comes up, uh, it's going to try um, and and it's going to need access to the data it thinks it needs to be storing, and it's not going to be there on that host, which is another reason why. Um, we're we're putting it on worker one now. We could use something like Ceph RBD here, right? As a, an alternative, we could put use block storage, and that wouldn't be a problem. But the performance would be um, it wouldn't be as good, right? I mean, obviously you're you're talking about IOs that are going to local disk as opposed to going across the network every time you're making an IO request. So this is a design decision that we're currently making for performance reasons. Okay, so. Um, if we essentially go look at um, the the second pod, it's identical. It's identical. The only thing that's different with the second pod is that basically, you know, it's got a different name. So instead of cluster one, it's cluster two, and it's the node selector set to work, worker two, right? So, but beyond that, it's exactly the same. So let's take a look at my cluster so that you can get a sense of what I've got. So I've got a single master, and then I've got you know two. Kubernetes workers, server one is worker one, server two is worker two. You can see that I'm not running any pods right now. If I do kube control get points, uh, get pods. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go off and I'm going to submit both of these GlusterFS pods, right? So I've submitted the first one and now I'm going to go submit the second one. And then I'm going to do kube control get pods. Um, and uh, if you do the dash O wide, um, this works same with OC right as well. Um, if in, in origin, you can actually see the nodes that the pods got scheduled on, which is useful in our example, right? You can see they're getting pinned to the right thing, right? So ready one out of one, the the cluster is running. So at this point, what we have is a cluster FS cluster running inside Kubernetes, right? Um, <clears throat> now I don't actually have any volumes to use yet, right? And um, I've actually got to be able to um, set the cluster up as well before I can con properly use the volumes, right? So the first thing um, I do is cube control exec into one of the pods. This is the same as doing like a Docker exec dash it, um, you know, bash or sh. Um, I reset the UID. This is just a, a bug in the image that um, the community image that I'm using. So um, you know, I, it's a step I have to do. And then the second step is to sort of tell Gluster what the, how to constitute the cluster. Now, in our ultimate design, we're planning on automating this, incorporating information in etcd, but I'm just doing it manually now. So I'm from the container, Gluster container on worker one, I'm probing the container, uh, second container on worker two, and then basically um, when I run cluster peer status, um, it looks at worker one and says, how many additional peers do you have? Well, I've got one additional peer, so a total quorum of two. Um, so I've got my cluster in effect, and now I can like go and create a volume, right? So now I can go create a, a, a volume called new vol. I specify the IP address of the first container, which I happen to be in right now and pass in a brick path. Uh, that was the host path volume that I mounted into the container that I spoke about earlier. And um, I pass in the second one um, as well for the second uh, container and its brick path, right? So that's great. Um, the, the command worked, so now I have a volume. I need to start it, uh, make sure that um, it's started and then double check that it's running. So um, if I do a cluster volume status, you can see that everything's running and you can see the two bricks. I'm going to highlight these um, that I created within that, right? So, um, so you see the two containers and the host path directories that they're using on each one of them. So now we have a cluster FS volume that's ready for use. Um, and we, we're um, 
able to actually use a Kubernetes application and configure it to uh, mount and use this cluster FS volume to serve some data. So the first thing um, that you, I'm showing is I run a mount command on the host and, and while I have a cluster FS volume, you can see that the, the volume's not there. In fact, that was a bit quick. So I'm just gonna go back a little bit. Um, so there we go. All right, so when you run mount, it'll show you all the available mounts on the host, right? I'm, I'm on the actual host right now. And um, you, you can see there, there are no mounts on the host. Um, so what I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to mount the volume that's running inside Kubernetes. And I'm just gonna create a file inside of it. Um, now, the Nginx application will automatically do this, um, but you know, I want to, it'll mount the volume, but the volume needs something inside of it you know, for me to actually do a demo. So I'm going to just um, mount the volume and then um, create a file inside of it, a little hello world.html. And then, um, so that will be there that when my web, Nginx web server uses the volume, I can basically test uh, that it can serve that file, right? So I've, this is how you do a cluster of face mount manually. It's pretty simplistic. Um, so when I run mount, you can see that the volume is then mounted at the bottom. Um, so it's, it's mounted one of the, the containers that gives it access to the entire volume. And now I'm going to just create a little hello world.html um, using VI onto the, the mount path. Okay, so now that's done. So now I can just unmount uh, the, uh, the volume from the master. And so it's not mounted at anywhere at this point after this command runs. If I run mount again, you see that it's no longer there on the host, right? Um, so now it's just living inside the containers with it not connected to anything. So now I'm going to, um, let's see, I'm going to show you the Nginx, um, well, actually, first I'm going to show you the, the endpoints file, right? So um, you can see if I run kube control get endpoints, I'm not running any endpoints right now uh, for GlusterFS. So um, what I'm going to do is show you the GlusterFS endpoints file. So this is something that you'd need to create to use a GlusterFS volume directly. And it's pretty simplistic. All this thing is an array of IP addresses of some of the addresses that are in the cluster. So um, now that that's done, um, I'm going to create uh, the endpoints file just to submit it. I'll do get endpoints and you can see that it's there. GlusterFS dash cluster is the label associated with the endpoints file. You can see the two IPs in there. Now I'm going to show you the uh, actual uh, web application. So it's a Fedora Nginx web image. I'm using the GlusterFS volume plugin. I'm using the GlusterFS dash cluster endpoint that I used. I'm mentioning the volume name that I created, and then in the read-only semantics, I say false, which means it supports full read-write. And then I'm mounting this into um, user share nginx HTML um, inside um, the container, right? So um, at this point, what will happen is it will take the GlusterFS volume I created, mount it inside the nginx web server at user share HTML test. This is the document root of the web server. So this is the place in the file system of the web server where it serves content from, right? So, um, so I'm gonna submit the pod at this point. So the, the application pod, the Nginx pod, and you can see it's still starting up. It's ready 0-1. You can see the other two uh, GlusterFS pods are still running and now it's ready one out of one. So we're good to go. Now I'm going to, um, I have to figure out what IP address um, this Nginx uh, GlusterFS um, uh, pod is running at um, so that I know what uh, URL to curl. So I do a describe pods and I find the IP that it, that's been assigned for the containers as running on worker two. So I'm just gonna shell into worker two now and run a curl command against that IP and then the, the path of the document root and let's see if it serves it from Gluster and it does. Right, so what we're seeing here is um, an Nginx web server mounting a GlusterFS volume and serving web content from it as demonstrated by this curl request. 
And that volume itself is running in side containers as pods inside Kubernetes. So that is the, the end of the demo um, and the end of the sort of overview. So at this point, I think uh, we can take some questions. Wow, <clears throat> that was that was awesome um, and and very fast. And I'm going to be watching that recording again and again. I think so I can figure out all the steps there. Maybe we need to turn it into a a, a step by step thing so we can walk through it. There um, actually is a step by step thing, um, and I will post that link in is um, in a GitHub repo. I'll post it in the Blue Jeans um, awesome. uh, chat window. Okay, perfect. That's it's a, a lot of. It was very interesting. Um, there, there was one question that popped up um, from um, Lee Calcott, of course, and he was asking how this all compared to um, Flocker. If you, he wanted your opinion on that. So, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not a Flocker expert. I've, I've chatted to them a few times at different conferences. Um, the, the Flocker is a lot sim uh, more similar to uh, the first part. Um, which is um, they, uh, so the first part, remember I spoke about having existing storage um, and being able to automate and manage um, connections. So as your containers move around your cluster, keeping that connection information to your storage around. Um, so that's one thing they do. And then they also have something to do with ZFS, I think where um, you can sort of use some storage that, um, appears to be direct attached like host path that is able to move around the cluster with you. Um, I don't know if they support dynamic provisioning at all. Um, so, you know, having um, projects be able to say, uh, you know, hey, I would like, um, you know, an EBS volume, go make me one. And that happened automatically. And I also do not believe they're doing anything in the hyper-converged model. So um, where they're, running the storage itself within containers. So I, I, I haven't seen anything pop up in the Q&A section here. Um, so I'm going to open it up again to see if there's folks. There's, there's a lot of folks on the call. Um, I think they may be stunned and amazed um, at, at how forward thinking some of this work is. But um, let's see if we've got anybody here. Yeah, on you coming in. Um, I think they just basically, they basically want your presentation so they can go all run out and try it now. Um, <laughs> I think that's, that's really it. It really was a very detailed and um, the step-by-step -step was probably one of the best that I've seen in a long time. And I'm not just doing this so that I can get you on another common briefing in the future, but I, I really appreciate the detail that you went into. It was very clear and concise. So thanks very much, Steve. Um, sure, no problem. <laughs> Popped in one more question. Um, just to be clear, you're using persistent volumes here to connect to bod, pods to clusters? Yes, so um, uh, so Nicholas, uh, just to um, clarify, um, so, pers so this is one of the things that I think we could describe a little better in the Kubernetes project, but um, the, there, there are two things that refer to storage in Kubernetes. There's volumes and persistent volumes. A volume is, is a storage asset that you have intimate knowledge of. In other words, you know what IP that thing's running on, um, what the volume is called. Uh, you basically are able to provide all the connection information to a storage adapter to connect to that thing directly. Okay, um, And that, and that uh, volume is um, an independent storage. It's not running inside OpenShift itself, right? Um, usually. Um, then... Uh, persistent volumes are similar, but they're abstracted. So the idea is that developers don't really care that, hey, I want to connect to this thing directly. Um, what they care about is, hey, I need you know 300 gigabytes of storage capacity um, on you know a, a shared file system or a non-shared file system, right? I, I want other people to be able to access this file system or just me, and I wanted to have you know this sort of sort of uh, I/O performance, right? Um, they don't really care what product is serving them. And so um, that's essentially the idea behind persistent volumes in that um, as an OpenShift administrator, you can create a ton of these persistent volumes. You can register them inside OpenShift and you can specify whether they are, what semantics they support. So whether they're read, write many, which basically means they're shared storage or uh, read, write once, which means that they're block storage. And 
And then when the developer makes their claim, they can sort of claim what they want and they'll just get something out of the pool that uses fuzzy logic that to best match what they want. So what do I mean by fuzzy logic? I mean that, um, you know, if you have a hundred uh, one terabyte um, uh, persistent volumes in the pool and um, the, and then you have say uh, uh, one 500 gigabyte volume in the pool, um, and a developer asks for 400 gigabytes, the developer's claim will be bound to the 500 gigabyte volume. So it does its best to match what's available with what's requested. Um, now, um, these things, what we're changing um, or hope to change within OpenShift um, and Kubernetes is the ability to provide um, for these persistent volumes and volumes to point to external storage clusters and, in, and, and add the ability to be able to run storage within OpenShift itself. And um, so that you can basically share the same infrastructure for your storage, compute, and network management. Well, well when that happens, we'll have you back on and um, doing another, <laughs> another session on all of that. That's pretty it. We're getting, we're getting the, the advanced warning here that things are going to get even more fun. Uh, so thanks again, Steve. Oh, yeah, yeah there's, so uh, there's a, another question here. So can one grow the storage once this has been claimed? That is in the plan, right? Only certain, um, uh, so for dynamic provisioning, right? Um, it sure would be annoying if um, you could provision storage, but then, um, you know, so say you provisioned, um, an EBS volume or something to that effect, and you put your database on it, and then you're like, oh man, uh, I didn't ask for enough uh, storage capacity, and then you run out of disk space, and your database, you know, won't come, won't restart, right? Um, and so for the volume types that we supported, the the current thinking in the design is that um, what you can do is set um, a flag on each storage type. Uh, associated with a particular label that says, hey, I'll allow the developer to manage this, right? And so, um, so say Diane um, is, you know, um, has some budget flexibility. Um, the OpenShift administrator can say, hey, Diane, you're building this cool application. You know, I'm gonna allow you to increase or decrease your storage capacity as you see fit. Um, you know, it's not going to be a financial problem for us. And so they can basically set the, the, the capacity management flag to developer as opposed to administrator. So that means developers are empowered. Now, obviously, um, that means that uh, when you go and look at your claims and, um, you know, it, not all claims are connected to things that will allow you to dynamically increase your storage capacity. Um, most of the cloud options do. Um, and the Applo one, the GlusterFS one that we're running co-located within OpenShift, we intend to offer that as well, right? So um, that's just scale out storage. It's it's not too hard to scale out once you've got some. You just throw more servers at it or more containers in this um, concept. So yeah, the long long answer is yes. Uh, the intent is to uh, allow developers themselves as well as administrators to increase their storage capacity when they need it. So, Nicholas, I, I've just taken you off mute. Is there anything else you'd like to ask rather than trying to do it through chat? Um, and, and can I ask you, are you already using Gluster there where you're at? No, we're not using Gluster. Um, one, one question I do have, you know, and it's somewhat on topic, but today, if one gets a, a persistent volume and the persistent volume, let's say, is defined as 50 gigs, and right now, the only supported sort of persistent volume until 3.1 was NFS. If that NFS volume was to grow and whomever claimed that persistent volume um, needed it, could that extra storage be taken advantage of even though it was only defined as 50 gigs? Um, I'm just trying to make sure I understand. Uh, um, so, so you're saying in the initial claim, you, you asked for 50 gigs, um, but uh, really the NFS share is capacity for 100 gigs. Can you keep, can, could you just, uh, you know, uh, keep growing to fill the available capacity? 
Yes. Yeah. So so right now for um, shared file storage, um, NFS and cluster, that is a conversation you can have with your storage administrator. So um, the way the the only way to constrain you to 50 gigs if the storage administrator puts a quota on your directory in NFS or cluster. So if they don't do that, you can technically grow cube or OpenShift will not in 3.0 and 3.1 will not currently limit you from growing beyond what you originally claimed if the administrator has not put a quota on you. Good to know. Thank you. No problem. Well, I'm looking, going once, going twice. I think that's got everybody covered. Um, thanks, Nicholas, for those questions. And if there's other topics that everyone would like to hear, I will um, post it to the Commons mailing list. Oops, here comes in one more. See, we can never give up on these questions. How do we handle things like snapshots? So um, we're designing AppLo to include snapshots. Um, there are trade-offs um, for things like snapshots in that they um, require much more complex uh, brick setup, right? So you have to thin provision an LVM and provide that to AppLo if you want it to support snapshots. But so AppLo is designed um, for, you know, its intent when we, you know, if we can get to a point where we're shipping it, um, that um, it will support snapshots. Um, the other, um, uh, Volume types, if they support snapshots, the intent is, um, you know, in future OpenShift releases that um, we will expose that feature to the developer in the same way that um, we expose um, the ability to increase your storage capacity. But again, not all storage platforms offer snapshotting, but for the ones that we do, we plan to, exp you know, build that into the volume plugin for that particular storage provider and so that we can expose it to both developers and administrators. Julem, I, I've taken you off mute, but you have to unmute yourself if you have a follow-up question to that. No, I'm okay. I'm, I was curious about snapshots, but I can probably start asking DR type questions, but I think it's probably way out of scope at this point. Thank you. All right, that's okay. All right. There we go. Going one, two, three. Well, it's the top of the hour almost. That's an hour long session, Steve. Uh, you deserve much kudos for um, a great session. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And we'll be back next week. Last week's session is now up, from, uh, which was storage as a service, or security as a service, rather, with Cryptarian. That's now up there if you'd like to review that as well. So um, check out commons.openshift.org slash briefings um, for the upcoming events and past recordings. And Steve will be up there shortly. Thanks, Steve. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.